Good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the Macmillan Education team, a very warm welcome to our Higher Education Symposium for 2022. If you can hear me, please do say hi in the chat box. Yep, somebody is there. So people are joining us for the event. Perfect. A very good evening to you all. Please do let us know where you are joining us from. Please do say hello. So as you know, this year's theme, uh, symposium theme is study skills, and we have an amazing lineup of speakers with us this evening. I would like to take a moment to personally thank our speakers and collaborators for helping us to make this such a wonderful event this evening. Of course, we would like to welcome Stella Cottrell, and I'm sure everyone is looking forward to listening to her experiences and her expert advice as much as I am. We do have one small change to our original schedule to note. Sadly, due to personal reasons, Barry Tadman is unable to join us this evening. However, he has passed the reins and his content to fellow publisher Dan Hum Soriano, who will conduct his session on his behalf. And I'm sure it will be just as excellent with Dan in the driver's seat. And we also warmly welcome director at Nile, Tom Kittle, for our final session this evening. Now, before we start our advancing learning evening, though, I do have a couple of announcements that I would like to share. If I can move this along. What are we doing? There we go. Okay, as expected, if you're here watching this now, you'll be registered as an attendee and therefore you will receive a certificate of attendance for the event. This will arrive in the next few days and please do check your spam folder. If you haven't received any emails before from the MENA PD Academy, it might end up there. In addition to this, we are also putting together a virtual goodie bag and uh, we'll include plenty of additional information um, and content in there as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that email. And the recording will go onto our YouTube page, uh, MENA PD Academy by Macmillan Education. So if you've got uh, commitments and you're not able to stay for the whole event, you will be able to catch up with what you missed there later. Okay, as mentioned, this symposium is brought to you by the MENA PD Academy by Macmillan Education MENA. If this is the first time that you are joining a MENA PD Academy event, welcome, first of all. And let me tell you a little bit about who we are at the MENA PD Academy. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Nathan Waller, and I am the lead teacher trainer for Macmillan Education in the Middle East and North Africa, or MENA region. Here I am. Hi, everyone. Now, at Macmillan Education, we wanted to improve our professional development offerings for English language teachers in MENA, so we created the MENA PD Academy as an online professional development community to inspire teachers, to empower teachers, and most importantly, to connect teachers across MENA and further our advancing learning programs. All teachers in MENA are welcome to join. Everything we do is for free and to take advantages of our activities. So don't delay register and join our PD community today, after the event, of course. Okay, I'm off to prepare even more awesome uh, professional development activities, but I hope you enjoy this event and you can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, or you can scan the code and check out our PD website if you wish. And don't forget to subscribe. Of course, we invite you to connect with our event partners as well. We have, of course, Niall joining us this evening. Niall is one of the world's biggest providers of training and development for English language teaching. Uh, they are a member of uh, English UK, the UK Chamber of Commerce, and are accredited by the British Council, as well as Equals and uh, Aquaduto. We're also welcoming Bloomsbury uh, this evening, who uh, until recently published the Macmillan Life Skills Series, which of course Stella's Study Skills Handbook is a part of, but they've got lots of other great content as well. And lastly, we absolutely have to mention that this event is being hosted in collaboration uh, between Macmillan Education and Saudi TESOL, which is the largest professional development organization in Saudi Arabia. And we're really, really happy to be collaborating with the Saudi, team, uh, Saudi TESOL team for this event. If you haven't heard of Saudi TESOL before, please do check out their website at saudi.tesol.org. Okay, at this point, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Ama Abdul Halim, 
who is our country manager for Saudi Arabia, to say a few words and to welcome Dr. Abdullah Albaji to officially start our event. Ahmed, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Macmillan Education MENA Higher Education Symposium, Achieving Academic English Through Study Skills. I'm Amr Abdel Halim, Country Manager of Macmillan Education and Springer Nature Office in Saudi Arabia. I wanted to start this symposium by thanking everyone who could attend the event today. I would like also to especially thank Dr. Abdullah Bergi for setting up this, this symposium through Saudi TC. Um, Dr. Abdullah Bergi is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and currently serves as the President of the Saudi TESOL and Dean of the English Language Institute, ELI, at King Abdulaziz University. He obtained his MA in, T in, in T ESL and PhD in Linguistics, Rhetoric and Composition from Arizona State University in 2001-2006, respectively. He is a certified site reviewer for the US-based Commission on English Language Program Accreditation. Prior to his appointment as Dean of the ELI at KU in early 2017, Dr. Berge had served as the ELI Vice Dean for development for seven years. He had also served as the Supervisor General of Strategic Planning in the Office of the KU Vice President for Educational Affairs. He has recently published two papers of the COVID-19 pandemic impact on ELT in Saudi Arabia. I would also like to thank our speakers, Stella Kotri, author of the bestseller, The Study Skills Handbook, Tom Kiddle from Nile, our strategic partner, and last but not least, Dan Soriano, our adult publisher. So let's start our symposium, shall we? With that, over to Dr. Abdullah Abaji. Welcome to the event. Um, if you'd like to say a few words, we'd love to hear them. Thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, uh, everyone, uh, wherever you may be in the world. It's um, as, as beautiful where you are as it is here in Jeddah. We've, we've just dipped today to maybe 27 now degrees Celsius. As, as far as we are concerned here in Jeddah, that's downright cold. And, uh, uh, First, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the McMillan Higher Education Symposium for 2022, which is being held this year in collaboration with Saudi TESOL and Nile. And as, um, as you know, the, the theme for this edition of the symposium is achieving academic success. It's a pleasure to be able to address the symposium and I want to uh, send out a very uh, special thank you to you, Nathan, uh, from Macmillan for providing me with this opportunity. Highly appreciated and thanks a lot. As we um, celebrate the first anniversary of the founding of Saudi TESOL, which is the only organization of its kind in Saudi Arabia to be endorsed by the Ministry of Education here, we are immensely proud not only of our membership role of 2,500 but also of the professional development activities that we've organized during our first year of existence. We embraced a vision uh, to become a professional hub for promoting quality English language teaching and enabling networking within the, the profession. And to fully achieve this vision, we have defined a set of professional goals that are supported by our members and our partners, both domestic and international. And now partnering with McMillan, a true giant in the ELT field means, I strongly believe that we are gathering steam in, in our efforts to benefit our members and to improve the quality of English language education in Saudi Arabia and beyond. And uh, if we look at the statistics today from the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia, it's promising that we are getting away uh, from this pandemic. And as we all begin to bounce back from the devastating effects of the pandemic, I think it is necessary to reflect on the practices we employ to make learning English more effective and more accessible to everyone. My call for such reflection is aimed specifically at ELT leaders and teachers who must make choices that drive positive results 
in, in creating an improved learning environment for our students. Certainly in this particularly difficult environment, there is a real need for transformational leadership in our field. And this can only be achieved through engaging in, in some very specific activities, such as consulting with experts, the experts like we're having in our panels today, following the research, being part of professional community like Saudi TESOL, and communicating clearly the reasons for the decisions that are, that are made. For nearly a century, there was no place or organization in modern Saudi Arabia since its foundation in 1932 that was dedicated to English language professionals. And now with Saudi TESOL, we have, we have one. In fact, this local home is going global now with our partnerships with McMillan and Nile. And, and Tommy, now our relationship with you is not new, and, and Nile is not new to us here at the English Language Institute at King Abdulaziz University. In fact, our relationship with Nile began many years ago through a consultation, professional development, and, and the opportunities to network with like minded organizations such as McMillan. Our partnership, our relationship with Nile has been based on three major principles, mainly trust, effective communication, and informed decision. And that's what we really cherish in our partnerships with international and local uh, organizations. And this has assisted us immensely in instilling excellence in our instructional practices, um, becoming who we are today, a world-class English language institute serving over 17 18, sometimes 19,000 students as they work to achieve their dreams of a better future. Our intentions, and I'll go back to Saudi TESOL now, and our intentions at Saudi TESOL are to continue to build partnerships with these top-notch ELT organizations so that we can promote English as a, as a valuable academic pursuit and one at which it is worth all the students' time and efforts to excel. This is our mission. And with your support and the support and professionalism of ELT leaders, authors, researchers, trainers, and teachers, we will fulfill our mission. Given whatever happened in the pandemic, I think the future of our discipline is in our hands and it is up to us to determine where we will take it. Again, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of you for attending today's symposium. And uh, Nathan, again, thank you very much for inviting me on behalf of McMillan. I would also like to thank Tom Kittle, the director at Nile, for uh, their partnership with us and supporting us in our endeavors. So without further ado, I know you're waiting for this. Let's sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of today's event and our great line of speakers, Stella, Bear, uh, Bear, sorry, you couldn't make it today, and Tom uh, Kittle. And I would like also to thank Stella for her amazing study skills framework. It has helped us in setting up, writing up our learning outcomes for study skills in our curriculum. Uh, we will uh, be able to hear a lot from uh, Stella and also uh, Tom about study skills and innovation and language education. Thank you all for being here. And I hope you enjoy and profit from today's symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abaji, for such uh, lovely and inspiring words um, to myself, uh, our speakers, and all of our guests out there who are joining us this evening. Um, and there's a lot of things for us all to think about, I'm sure, in, the, in those words. And to be moving forward, as you said, uh, hopefully with the end of the pandemic, um, new research, will come forward, it'll inspire us to move forward again. Okay, as he mentioned, I'm sure you're all very keen to get into the content of this evening. The event is being uh, done in collaboration with Macmillan's Skillful Second Edition. I'm not actually gonna talk about it now, I'll come back at the end um, and uh, fill in any gaps because I think you're gonna see some examples from Skillful as we go through the event. So I don't need to say much about it here. 
Before I introduce our first speaker, though, I do want to take the opportunity to introduce our Global Teachers Festival, which is coming up on the 14th of February. It's going to last two weeks. I'm sure Stella won't uh, mind me taking a minute to mention this because I know that she's going to be uh, following up her session this evening with another session at the festival itself. So do go and check out the festival. Um, I've got a little video, one minute, which is Will uh, introducing our uh, festival. Are you interested in developing your skills as a teacher of English? Do you want a wide range of topics to choose from and the option to attend a live webinar at a time that suits your busy teaching schedule? Then you'll be glad to hear that the Advancing Learning Global Teachers Festival from Macmillan Education is back for another series of world-leading teacher training delivered by expert speakers from all over the world daily from the 14th to the 25th of February 2022. We've talked on areas like global citizenship education, literacy, exam skills, psychological research and ELT, thinking skills, collaborative learning, well-being and loads more. I can assure you there is something for everyone. Register for free at macmillanenglish.com slash GTF now to reserve your virtual seat. See you there. I can see somebody mentioning in the um, chat box that they, they attended last year and it was amazing. I think this year is going to blow last year's away. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. So go to the, the website and register for the festival. Okay, without further ado, I am going to stop screen sharing um, and give Stella a second to start screen sharing and then we will begin with the first presentation. Okay, while she's uh, starting up her presentation, Stella, good evening. Hello. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. I hope everybody else is as well. Wonderful. Before you get going, let me introduce you to everyone. I, you probably don't need very much introduction. I mean, even I knew you when I was at university in the UK back in the late 90s. So I'm pretty sure you don't need, but I will introduce you anyway for those people in the audience. Dr. Stella Cottrell is a million copy selling author whose titles include the Study Skills Handbook, which I personally used, uh, Critical Thinking and the 50 Ways series. Uh, these are all, a lot of them are part of the Macmillan Life Skills series, uh, now published by Bloomsbury. Formerly, she was Director of Lifelong Learning at the Universities of Bedfordshire and Leeds, and she was Pro Vice Chancellor for Learning and Teaching at the University of East London. And currently, She's a leadership coach for senior staff in education. Stella, a very warm welcome, a very warm welcome to the event tonight, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much, and I will uh, see you at the end. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I will monitor the chat box and I will extract some so that Stella can answer them at the end. There's also a Q and A option, so please feel free to use that as well. I will check both. Um, I would recommend changing the chat option to everyone so that we can all see your questions and comments. Thank you very much. And Dr. Stella, over to you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Nathan. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, you've probably picked up from what Nathan has been saying, I've always been very passionate about study skills. So I'm delighted to be here as part of this event. I hope you all enjoy it, and I'm sure you'll all gain something from it. My talk is going to consider six important ways that the higher education context has been changing since the end of the 20th century and how these changes impact on students, learning and study skills in the 21st century. In the process, I will consider the APT-S study skills framework and I'll look at some ways we can support students and also some resources that can help. Just one point before I begin is that I do refer to various research studies as I go through. Um, you don't need to scribble all of those down. The full list will be on the final slide, which we'll leave up. And also Nathan has said that he'll send that in your virtual goodies bag. So the first aspect I want to consider is the growing appreciation of the value of study skills and their potential for enhancing students' ability to learn. Here is a sketch of the German philosopher Hegel, 
teaching students in the early 19th century. Even back then, students needed to manage their time. It'd be very obvious if they were absent from such small classes. They had to listen attentively and follow up on the topic after class. They had to make good notes, especially as books were rare. They needed organisational skills to access resources and to have the right study tools. And they had to make sense of difficult material to construct and critique arguments, to solve problems and to write well on given topics. Such skills are still at the core of what is required for study today, and they likely will be into the foreseeable future. At that time, and for most of the 20th century, if students didn't already have good study skills and useful study habits, it was unlikely they would receive any help to acquire them. Educational success was associated almost entirely with inherent intellectual ability and, to some extent, good moral fibre. If students were not achieving well, it was then assumed they were not very bright and that there was little anybody could do about it. One reason for this was that there wasn't much belief that academic outcomes could be improved by educating students in how to learn better. There were also few incentives or drivers to do so and few resources. Fortunately, since the end of the 20th century, the landscape for study skills has changed dramatically. Why is this? Well, for a start, opinion began to change about whether it was feasible to enhance students' ability to learn. As late as 1994 in the bell curve, Hernstein and Murray were claiming that you couldn't improve intelligence or what were taken as signs for intelligence by inputs from education and training. In other words, study skills would be pretty pointless. Weak students would always be weak. However, already the seeds of change were in the wind. In 1999, sorry, 1991, research by Chechi and others found what no doubt many teachers already knew, that early years education could affect intelligence scores. That is, what you achieved academically was not just about genetics. Chechi's research was with small children. Remarkably, it was as recently as 2012, so just 10 years ago, that Brint and Galloway in Oslo, Norway, found that the education received during middle teenage years could continue to have an impact on intelligence scores in later life. And at around the same time, amazing work at UCL by Herzog and others showed that occupation and environment continue to have a powerful ongoing impact on how the brain developed in adults. The brain's plasticity means we can shape it through what we learn and how we learn it. So we have a much better understanding of post-childhood intellectual development. In recent years, there has been a huge, if rather belated, growth in research into students' learning in higher education. We're developing a much better understanding of the value of assisting students to learn, as well as the variety of ways in which individuals learn. We are also becoming much more aware of myriad factors that affect students' learning. Here are just some, such as the amount of time spent on task, Practice, practice effects, family pressures, disability, whether students understand what's expected of them, the conventions of the learning context, and even ongoing myths about intelligence. And as we learn more, the picture keeps getting richer. In recent years, there's been more interest in things like the power of study habits or stereotype threat, self-belief and peer impacts. And if anyone is interested uh, in peer impacts, that's what I'm going to be doing my talk about at the uh, Global Teaching Festival um, that Nathan's just been talking about. So how do good study skills help? They enable students to manage the learning process more efficiently and effectively, and to deal better with all of those factors that affect successful study, such as the ones we've just been looking at. Good study skills means that students can do this with minimum stress and maximum enjoyment. That has benefit for the students, but also for teachers, support staff and the university or college. This is probably a good place to mention that the term study skills is somewhat a misnomer. 
it's a quick, useful and recognisable shorthand for what are really a wide range of skills, attitudes and behaviours that impact on learning. And I'll say more about those in a moment. I use this simple diagram in the study skills handbook to illustrate that study skills are what enable students to take on all those factors that affect learning to manage their particular learning environment or context. One reason for the growing appreciation of study skills is that when they are integrated well into provision, they make a difference. We have time to look briefly at just one piece of research that illustrates this. It's by Cromley and focused on STEM students. It found, firstly, that students' grades and their persistence on course are affected by study skills such as motivation and self-efficacy. Self-efficacy itself involves various aspects such as confidence, a desire to learn more and remaining focused. Students who are well motivated learnt better and vice versa, so to improve learning, raise motivation. The second key aspect of the changing study skills landscape that I want to look at is the increased pressure to enhance student outcomes. There has been a phenomenal growth in higher education with a move to mass participation worldwide. This has led to many new universities and a greater strain on the supply of and demand for students who will achieve well. Wider access meant many students started to enter higher education who would not have thrived in the learning environments of the past. If things didn't change, they were more likely to fail. Now, interestingly, just at that time, international league tables started to play a much larger role. Student outcomes and rankings of their experience can affect the university's league table rankings and their reputation and their ability to attract students and staff and income. So competition for students, league tables, institutional reputation, and in some countries, the fees and the funding regimes, all these provided incentives for paying more attention to student outcomes. Higher education institutes want high and timely completion rates. They don't want the students hanging around. They want to maintain high standards, but also for more of their students to achieve those high standards and attain good degrees. And they need their students to progress to well-paid, recognisably graduate jobs. So they've had to look differently at what they teach and how they teach and the skills contents of their courses. They have a vested interest in understanding inputs such as study skills that help students to achieve. In addition, universities and colleges are under pressure from employers and governments to produce graduates who are not only able to gain graduate employment, but who are also work ready with schools that boost business, industry and national economies. Around the world, there is a, a demand for graduates who can work and communicate well with other people, who understand the needs of the workplace, who can be trusted to get on with the job, being adaptable and flexible and resilient, who have good critical thinking skills, who can be trusted with complex tasks and to make sound decisions. Here in Saudi Arabia, for example, and you'll know much more about this than me, Vision 2030 aims to ensure higher education outcomes are in line with the requirements of the job market. The Tatwir project called for training in critical thinking, that's a very core study skill, especially for teachers, in order to make Vision 2030 a reality. In Skills for Success, the fourth edition so in 2021, I look at some of the graduate skills most in demand from employers this century. For example, the World Economic Forum list of 16 skills for the 21st century emphasizes academic skills such as critical thinking that we would expect of graduates, but note the prevalence of items that involve people skills. I've indicated those with a P, such as cultural literacy, collaborative working, social awareness, and also those with some aspect of self-management, that's the S, so self management abilities such as being able to persist and to adapt and to show initiative and to lead. 
In 2020, the top five skills in a LinkedIn survey of employers were emotional intelligence, newest to the list and already most in demand, plus creativity, collaboration with others, adaptability and persuasion. Again, quite a demand for people and self-management skills. Similarly, the 2020 Bright Report shows demand for people skills such as teamwork, leadership and communication and self-management attributes such as resilience. So that takes us to the third aspect of the changing study skills context. Universities are not just expected to develop students' study-related skills and behaviours and attributes, but also to nurture a much wider range of these. Changes to curricula in response to external demands means changes to the skills needed for successful study. So those skills we referred to at the start of the talk, we might refer to them as traditional, even though they're still fairly recent in some ways. These remain essential, the reading, the note making, writing essays or papers, critical thinking, revision exams, etc. But now there's a higher expectation that students will behave differently and engage more actively, both in the curriculum and alongside it, maybe on work placement or in the community or similar. There may be set assignments with multiple parts with a written component, but also requirements, say, to work in teams and to apply their learning. It might involve an industrial project in collaboration with peers abroad, keeping a reflective log and leading a webinar for their class back home. Or working in a group using cutting edge technologies, maybe making 3D printouts of artifacts or biomaterial and then presenting their work to researchers or to business. This trend is fueled by rapidly changing technologies and pedagogies. Students might be learning in very different ways across the week or in the day or even in a single lesson. That can be great for bringing interest to learning, but students then need different sets of skills for each task and context and type of group. And then there is the international dimension. Although COVID has restricted choices in recent years, the underlying trend is to increase internationalism of business, work, life and study. Students want to position themselves better in the global labour labor market. According to OECD data, there has been a rise in student mobility from around 800,000 in 1975 to over 6 million by 2019 with about 5% increase year on year. And in addition to that, there are many millions more studying internationally online. Now businesses value students who are used to interacting with diverse people from different countries and backgrounds and language groups, bringing cultural sensitivity and more advanced communication skills and confidence in their interactions. So whether for study or life or future work, intercultural competence is becoming an important skill. Indeed, a whole chapter of the 2019 edition of the Study Skills Handbook has now been dedicated to it. Now, it can be hard to visualise, perhaps, the complexity for students of this explosion in the potential variety of learning experience and skill demand. The growing variety of teaching and learning methods from traditional methods through to collaborative, social, immersed and self-tracking, flipped classrooms and so on and so on. Coupled with much more varied assignments from essays to designing apps to critical reflection on academic or professional practice to live briefs for industry, organising events, designing apps, critical self-reflection, reviewing all sorts of materials online and then using multiple technologies to be dealing with their class learning, their independent learning and their assignments. Using lecture capture, study apps, chat, referencing tools, robotics, data-driven performance dashboards and many others. So as university curricula and pedagogies develop, partly in response to the pressures of business and government, more and more skills are required of students, as this long list shows, and it could go on for much longer. In fact, it was much longer and I made it smaller so you could read it on screen. So things like creativity that weren't really in there before and networking, very strong sort of demand for that from Australia and collaboration, cultural competence, 
cultural competence that I've just mentioned, resilience, adaptability, and much more. And many universities track 20 or more of these skills through the curriculum. That's a lot for students and for staff. And they often do this as if the skills were disparate, ignoring all of the connections between them. So all of that, in effect, is very overwhelming. In, in effect, it generates a study skills of itself. This brings me to the fourth aspect that I want to look at. The need to manage that sense of multiplicity, complexity and overwhelm for students and for staff. <coughs> such as by simplifying how we categorise and present study skills. There are many ways that study skills can be categorised, and the temptation is to keep adding new categories, thinking this won't fit, let's just generate another category. But I keep coming back to just four interrelated set of, of skills. These could be termed intellectual, interpersonal, operational and intrapersonal. When working with students, I was forever translating those, though, into academic people, task and self. This is a much more user friendly, immediate and memorable terminology. Students can relate to it much more easily. In this diagram, we have the student here at the centre of their world. When they're trying to learn, there's all this stuff going on in their whole learning environment whether it's the teaching methods or the assignment brief, the subject content, their peers and finances and feedback and culture and so on. And as well as all that, there's the baggage that they bring from the past, which they have to manage, and there's all that they're expecting from their future. So self-management, that inner circle, these, those skills are the first line of defence or the first set of tools, if you like. Self-management, knowing yourself well and being able to direct what you do that's a really important study skill. It helps students make the best use of those other three skills so that they can have more control over their studies and indeed over the whole learning process. I'm going to come back to self-management. Let's, um, let's focus um, on each of the other three and just unpack those a little bit first. So first of all, the academic skills. Here, these are including things such as thinking skills, especially the critical thinking, which we've mentioned, but also creative, reflective, problem solving, thinking about thinking or metacognition and developing memory, as well, of course, as the investigative or research skills and understanding the academic conventions of the course. One academic skill that I mentioned, critical thinking, is especially in demand. It's important to academic study, though, as it has the biggest effect on grades on most courses. It's also one of the most difficult. It can be really hard for people to grasp that critical thinking is primarily about valid argumentation. That is, drawing conclusions that are based on reasons that are logically acceptable reasons and themselves based on valid inference and valid evidence. In other words, critical thinking is not what it is often assumed to be, that is, merely objecting to things or criticising or offering any old reasons or thoughts and opinions and views about what we want to be true, or just talking about stuff, discussing and summarising and listing facts and describing and all sorts of other ways in which critical thinking is sometimes referred to. It's so complicated that it normally does require some training in both critical thinking and also in critical self-reflection. But moving on to people skills, these include collaborative and team working, but also being able to lead a team and to follow a leader well, to be able to take turns and to negotiate and to persuade and to take criticism and to do so with people you might not get on with and in difficult situations or when you don't like what they have to say. Obviously, good people skills are related to emotional intelligence and good self-management, too. Interestingly, when United Kingdom universities were required to introduce personal development planning and employability into all of their courses, lecturers told me that this is one of the areas that they would struggle with the most. And the purple book, Skills of Success, was designed for students, 
but really to help the teaching staff to develop people and self-management skills with their classes, given the requirement that they do so. And then we have task management, being able to execute any task from start to finish in a well-planned, systematic way, following the appropriate protocols. For students, this might be writing an essay or preparing for an exam or preparing for a job interview. But it's also about using the right resources and technologies and using your initiative to get a task done. And finally, self-management or self-efficacy, reflecting meaningfully about how we think, act, learn and manage ourselves for study or indeed whatever situation we are in. That incorporates many sub skills, emotional self-management, managing your mindset, taking charge of your attitudes, even knowing what your attitudes are, motivating yourself, taking care of your well-being so you're in a, in a fit state to study, managing stress, using stress, staying focused on your own goals, even knowing what your goals are and so on. So these are broadly the four categories. Depending on the context, some students prefer to see skills as belonging to a different one of those categories. For example, time management could be an example of either self or task management, really depending on which um, aspects of it, of it they are focusing on. I don't think it's useful to be too precious about exactly which skill fits into which category, um, at not least as all four categories are mutually self-supporting. And also most study tasks require three or four of the four of the four APTS or APTS categories. If we look at the trajectory of study skills since the last decades of the 20th century, that initial small amount of interest represented by those two small boxes in giving a little bit of support to academic thinking and tasks, that grew in importance. And then people skills started to become recognised and to grow in importance. And as time goes by, there is more attention on all of those skills. So all of the boxes are now much bigger and self-management skills have become recognised as just as important. This is partly about a growing concern about student stress and mental health and well-being. And I think partly just a greater interest in self-efficacy. I also want to make the point briefly that APTES isn't just about study. It's applicable to other contexts. In employment, for example, you need to reflect on practice to get the job done, contribute to teams, manage your time and so on, just as when you're studying. Indeed, many of these skills, as we have seen, have entered the academic curriculum because of the influence of skills demands from the workplace. The fifth aspect of study skills for the 21st century I want to look at are particular aspects of self-management that are now coming to the fore. Student well-being has been rising up the agenda for most of the last decade. Self-reporting of stress and anxiety is high, in some ways perhaps a bit too high because of the ways in which things are recorded. But nonetheless, we are much more aware of it than we used to be. In one survey in the UK, for example, 70 to 80% of the students reported very high levels of stress. And there are similar reports about stress and poor sleep, poor diet and risky behaviours from around the world, from China to India to the USA. Locally, for example, there is Solomon's study of medical students at King Saud University in Riyadh. Student stress factors included a perceived lack of time, demanding too much of themselves, anxiety about tests and others. It's good to see that the students did have some coping strategies, but the report nonetheless concluded that the prevalence of perceived stress among medical students was high. This might affect not only their academic performance, but also all aspects of health and life. So a big deal. In a similar report on dental students at King Saud University, stress factors included workload and clinical requirements, but also social challenges. As the language used in sources and instruction is mainly English, low proficiency in English was also a stress factor. And again, the author concluded that strategies of stress management must be incorporated into dental education to ensure the output of effective dentists. There are similar reports from universities in the region and for other courses such as nursing. 
Now, a different, though related self-management issue is that of developing mental stamina. As students progress through higher education and also into professional life, they need to be able to sustain their attention in order to undertake complex tasks successfully. Interestingly, Einstein himself claimed that it was not that he was cleverer than everyone else, but that he stayed with problems for longer. The ability to persevere and maintain focus can atrophy or strengthen, depending on how we train our attention. Current student behaviours, especially the way that technology is used, can undermine student efficiency and decrease their attentional abilities. A survey by Barney McCoy at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2015 found that on average, students spent around 20% of class time, class time on activity unrelated to study, such as texting, surfing the web, social media, and playing games. The greater number of technologies students had open, the worse their concentration for the task. There are other studies that suggests that simply using laptops and screens in class can impair not only your own performance, but also that of people sitting near you. There seems to be a widespread opinion that today's students have some kind of human, superhuman abilities in multitasking unknown to previous generations. It's a nice idea, but research has shown that the brain is actually designed to focus just on one non-automated task at a time. Learning in class and engaging with multimedia are not automated tasks, so the brain is put under strain. In fact, multitasking is an illusion. We think we are carrying out tasks simultaneously, as in the box on the left, but in practice we're switching back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, very quickly between tasks, as on the right. Research by Ophir at Stanford University found that students who think they are gifted multitaskers perform worse than those who undertake one task at a time. They're poor at filtering out distractions, poor at changing from one task to another, and poor at organizing their thoughts. Another study found that students solving maths problems took 40% longer when they were required to switch tasks. And it gets worse. Every time the brain switches back and forth between tasks, Obviously, it has to work harder, leading to tiredness, less task satisfaction and emotional negativity. Stone argues that task switching puts the brain into a continual state of partial attention, maintaining it in a stressed flight or fight mode. Constant task switching deprives the brain of the spaces and the pauses that it needs to function properly, to form strong neural connections, to lay down memories, and to connect to empathy and creativity. So those effects are undesirable in themselves and they're affecting student stress, anxiety and well-being. So research indicates that students use technologies in ways that are reducing their attentional abilities, undermine their cognitive potential and could affect their study success. A study by Rosen and others in 2013 observed students minute by minute for 15 minutes in independent study. The students struggled to keep their attention focused on their main task for more than six minutes at a time. And they wasted a third of their study time in activities such as wandering around, texting, using social media, and even watching television. The good news is that attention and mental stamina can be trained. Teachers can help in various ways, such as by gradually building the time that they require students to spend on task and reassuring themselves that they can spend longer on task. They can set interesting and challenging tasks that make them want to stay focused on task for longer. They can also desist from encouraging learning in bite sizes or always opting for the shortest and easiest books. They can promote better sleep. They can build in study time away from screens. They can integrate self-management skills, including self-reflection about how they study and how they use technologies. Such training in self-reflection pays off. For example, for students in one study who received self-reflection training, the pass rate for a national maths exam was 25% higher than for a control group that didn't get the training. 
the students trained in self-reflection had greater self-efficacy and also made more accurate judgments about their work. Many universities indeed have introduced mindfulness training to help students cope with stress and anxiety. There are thousands of studies being conducted into the efficacy of mindfulness with mixed results, but many of these find training and daily practice in meditation also improves mental focus, concentration, memory, task satisfaction, and overall positivity. So it can counter some of the ill effects of the poor use of technologies. If you're interested in knowing more about that, you might like my book, there's a picture of it there, Mindfulness for Students, which covers for students many of the aspects that I've just been discussing. You might also um, be aware of the local initiative, the Mindful Jeddah Training Programme, or MJTP. Um, in case you don't, this was a three week pilot to help with student stress and anxiety um, with relatively small numbers, but um, it found again that mindfulness had a positive effect. The sixth and final change that I want to address is the trend towards multifaceted, multi channel, whole university approaches to skills development. The questions that used to be asked were when should study skills be introduced? In foundation courses or the start of university or later in the course when students realize they need them or should study skills be standalone or integrated or delivered by lecturers or by specialists or students who are peers or by counselors and now the answer is all of the above we need a whole university approach to supporting students learning with different aspects delivered or reinforced at different times by different people the environment, resources, curriculum and culture all play a part. The data and IT teams helping with detailed analytics on student progress and engagement. So everybody's responsibility. And study skills is now a feature across the whole student journey with, say, flying start courses at some universities for applicants who received an offer. Study skills are built into induction courses or orientation modules and integrated into the curriculum. Resources are available online and in libraries. Pop-up events and study festivals focus on what might be needed at very particular times in the student's life, life cycle. And as part of the personal planning that is offered and at every level of study, and of course, as part of their English language courses. Now, students are busy people and they have to prioritize. So that they will want to know that the people around them, in particular their teaching staff, feel that study skills really matter. This means that they need their course and their study resources to make that very apparent, to integrate study skills, to signpost when they're being taught or reinforced, to provide hooks for further investigation into the skills and to return to them at each level of study to show how they are now relevant. For example, as we're going to be looking at, um, at Skillful later, in the Macmillan Skillful course itself by Lida Baker and Stephen Gershon, study skills are structured into the course. And this is evident right from the beginning in the content. So here you can see study with others and strategies for taking notes while listening. It's then flagged in the introduction to each of the books in the series. And just underneath there to the left hand, you can see some, it starts off with some tips about just telling students how to arrive uh, and prepare for coming into class. And then each chapter introduces some aspect of study skills in brief. There are activities that lend themselves to useful study related discussions. For example, here, there are is a, a potential to be looking at the night based lifestyle that many students seem to have um, through this consideration of day and night people and the different effects that it has upon their sleep and their well being. Also, there are hooks to other resources. So obviously I didn't write the Skillful books, but you can see that there are snippets taken from one of my books, the Study Skills Handbook, the 2013 edition there. And students can then follow up on relevant skill, study skills in more depth if they wish to, such as in these books, which are by me, but other products are available. For the 2019 or fifth edition of the Study Skills Handbook there on the left, that's the green one, that picks up on most of the skills that I've referred to in this talk. And the purple one, Skills for Success, looks at things like creativity and self-efficacy and people skills in more depth as part of personal planning and for study and for employment. 
And you might have been thinking that these changes are going to be putting increased demands upon teachers too. And I think that you'd be right if you were thinking that. So if so, today's sessions by Dan and Tom should really help. And as we've mentioned, there's also the Global Teaching Festival coming up in February. So to sum up on these key aspects of study skills for the 21st century, study skills are more necessary and more appreciated, not least to boost institutional outcomes and national agendas. Traditional study skills are still essential, but a much wider range of skills and attributes is becoming expected. These can be broadly categorised as academic, people, task and self-management skills, which I refer to as APT-S. And within those, there's an increasing focus on self-management skills. We need to counter some of the negative impacts of technologies, especially on attentional processes and well-being. And study skills are increasingly a whole institution concern impacting on teaching, resources and training. And as promised, resources that I've referred to are here on the final screen. And as I mentioned, Nathan will also be sending those to you. So thank you very much for listening. Stella, thank you uh, so much for, for that. I mean, it's so interesting. I'm just, uh, Normally I sit here and I also kind of write some questions uh, as I'm going along. I'm like, oh, I'm having this thought and that thought, but I was actually just so kind of gripped all the way through. It's such an interesting topic um, of study. Um, I'm kind of tempted to give up everything that I'm planning on doing for the rest of the year and just focus on study skills now. I really think it, 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 there's so much there. There's so many different areas that we can delve into. Uh, there's loads of, everybody's kind of all of a sudden become very active on the, on the chat box. And I think that's also key to just how interesting it was. Normally people are kind of making comments along the way. And I think everybody is probably just like me, just focused on the screen and, and listening to what you're saying. It was so interesting. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, I didn't see any really direct questions about the content. Somebody was mentioning something about reading in, in Saudi Arabia. Reading is often not, uh, there's not really a culture of reading for students uh, or for young learners as well. Do you have any kind of tips on how maybe to get students reading? It's not really related to study skills, but have you got any tips? Well, I suppose I mean, the obvious one, the finding things that make them want to read. I mean, for most things, it comes back to motivation, doesn't it? So, so if I haven't got a, a habit of reading, what would make me want to do that? So I suppose the, the teachers will know their students the best and think what would, what, what would be the hooks that would make them want to read something? I mean, I don't think, I think if you think over here, there was a, a, a decline amongst um, younger children wanting to read. And then people came out with, you know, one or two of the famous books, which I won't name for the moment, uh, about wizards and such like. And suddenly everybody was, you know, was reading those books and, you know, and the sales of those are fantastic. So it's finding, you know, what, what are the sort of things which would be of real interest um, and which the students can only get hold of by reading in text. So, I mean, what, what would be the purpose of people having to read within Saudi Arabia? Now, if they think they want to be getting very good grades on their course, that could be your hook in. So it could be about talking through uh, in advance what it is that they want to achieve from their study, what um, kind of grades that they want, and then working back from that, how, do you, how does one have to prepare in order to get those grades? And then reading might become part and parcel of that um, that journey they have to take. I don't know that students are always that aware of what it is that they need to do when they get into university. In fact, it's interesting because somebody did say to me once when, I'm trying to think, it might have been when I was in China, that um, there was a big emphasis there on the students getting into university and an awful lot of their English um, courses and their, um, their, their study at school was really on just getting through school and getting into university as if that was the end goal and they really hadn't been sufficient attention to and then what then a whole new world opens up so i think the more one can start looking at what the requirements of of the university journey is going to be before the students get there uh, and the earlier that they can be excited by that then the more one can get them into reading um, and uh, any other kind of skills that they're going to need when they get into university yeah absolutely and i, I mean i've 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 taught, I've examined in lots of different parts of the world, uh, China being one of them um, and the Middle East being another. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult to uh, find ways of getting students to read for pleasure. It, it's it's a really difficult one, um, but I think there's one that is is quite key, um, and it's it's good to see new course books coming through with with a stronger literacy strand, a component, getting students to read content that's not necessarily Western, uh, can be from a variety of sources. Um, yeah, and just getting them interested in the world through reading, I think. But I think uh, I, I agree with what you say about, um, I think students need to know exactly how much they're gonna need to read at university, because I don't think many high school and perhaps college students really know actually how much reading is expected mm. at, at university level. So, so maybe there's something that we could do to, to bridge that gap, perhaps. Um, I think so. And maybe also uh, developing students' confidence, because if they haven't already done very much reading and they see what looks like a big book, it can seem quite daunting to them. And I think I was mentioning to you when we had a, a conversation recently that when we were going in to do courses for uh, some of the big companies um, in Leeds, when I was teaching at Leeds, the, um, the students were of very, very mixed ability. Some of them had masters, but some of those students uh, uh, on those programmes, and they were quite short programmes, hadn't even you know, done the basic minimum of qualifications at school. And there they were studying alongside master's students on their, on their business courses. Um, and they, they were terrified of reading because they hadn't done very much of it. And yet by the end of those quite short courses, because of the sorts of encouragement and the way they were carried through a, a textbook, they were reading the, the very um, uh, um, ambitious text that the tutor had set, which was an enormous business organization textbook. Um, and the business itself was so amazed at how all the students became so keen on reading these enormous books that they bought one for every single participant, which they hadn't expected that they would do. So I think one can very quickly support students through a reading process and get them to appreciate and feel proud about the kind of reading that they've accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's there's so many comments coming through that I can't even pick up the questions anymore. I mean, I think that the the content of the presentation was so uh, so in depth. I mean, I was writing things like, "This is so broad. How can teachers focus down um, and, and really concentrate, focus in on certain skills?" But I think you answered that question as you went through um, things about is it too overwhelming for students? But I think you covered that as well. I'm really happy to see that well being has taken. Uh, it's become so prominent um, over the last couple of years. I think that's a real, uh, I mean, there's not that many highlights of COVID, I'm sure, but I think one of the positives within education is definitely this refocus on uh, the fact that how we feel affects our ability to learn. I think that's been a really a positive thing. Um, I do actually have a question. Do you think this study still should be done with much younger students in perhaps their first language first, or do you think it doesn't make a difference? I think that um, the, uh, I mean, you already referred to just how overwhelming it can be to be presented with all of these skills, even when they're all very well integrated. And one can come up with really good projects where students don't even notice just how many of the skills that they've accomplished. Oh, and at yeah. the end of it, you know, rehearse with them. Well, you've, you, you were being creative and you've worked in a group and you've done all of these things and they can be amazed at what they've achieved. So I think you can do that with really small children. If you set quite a small children on a project and doing a presentation thing, they're already developing some of that inner confidence which is some of those things crossed off the list for when they then move up into higher um, levels of uh, of learning and of course i suppose if you do some things with children they they go through confidence phases and then confidence gets kicked back and you've got to support them you know i think thinking in particular about doing presentations you know there have been some um, courses with underachieving children where they've um, train those children to stand up in front of others and give a talk on things which they just thought they'd never do and that's fantastic but one can imagine that by the time you know eight or nine years have passed they might have forgotten just how competent they were and one might have to you know retrain some of those skills yeah yeah absolutely okay so we've run over time a little bit uh, and i can see dan waiting to uh, move on to the next presentation dan i saw your hand up did you have a question for stella or was that just for me I, it, was, it was just a comment. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to join in, but um, in in the I, you know taking Stella's idea of uh, self reflection um, and applying it to reading, um, one of the things that I've heard recently is that uh, the amount that people are reading actually has increased 
It's just that it's small amounts of text in a huge number of different platforms and places. So um, perhaps you know, taking that idea of self-reflection and getting um, students to reflect on the fact that they are dealing with huge, um, huge amounts of text, but they need to get used to dealing with huge amounts of text in a single volume. But it, yeah, they, they are used to that mm. amount of analysis. So perhaps changing our approach to the way that students engage with content is also uh, a large part of developing, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. In fact, I, I would probably add on I'm, in most of the sessions that I do, I, I tend to add on this, this, I guess, tip that I'm a really big fan of student generated content, but also students mm -hmm. reflecting on content that they've engaged with for future students. So you finish the, the academic year, students reflect on it and tell you how they would how they would do it again if they were coming into the year next year that makes sense yeah so i'm i'm a really big fan of this kind of of approach to uh, us teachers self-assessing what we do i think anyway you pick up some nice peer learning points which maybe i'll um pick up on next week or week after next at the uh, the global teach yes uh, well i'll be there listening to that so maybe i'll have some questions in the chat box for you stella <laughs> okay Ella, thank you so much once again. Uh, so much, um, so many lovely comments and so much love in the chat box uh, for your session. So informative. Um, and hopefully, everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, if you'd like to stop screen sharing, uh, and I would like to introduce uh, Dan, who is our next presenter. And I saw lots of comments, Dan, as we were going along about how to actually implement some of this stuff, how to make it uh, practical. Um, and embed it into what we're actually doing. So it's not something that's independent, that we need to think, oh, I, I need to be doing something to get them collaborating. As Stella was just saying, integrating everything into. And I think that your session now is really going to kind of harness in on, on those aspects. So let me introduce uh, Dan from uh, Sorano. Soriano, that's right. I'm pronouncing your name that's right. right. That's perfect. Yeah. perfect. Uh, Dan, I will pass the reins to you. Good luck. And I will collect again any questions in the chat box that you have for Dan, and we will address them at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, well, following, following Stella's incredible talk um, is going to be a challenge, but I'm, I, I want to pick up on uh, some of the threads um, that she mentioned. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be looking at bringing uh, study skills to life. And I'm going to kind of playing on playing on that idea of bringing it to your life, of course, but also um, bringing it to life in the sense of making it more um, interesting and uh, making it, making students um, become in, involved with. It. Um, so I want to begin uh, by looking at um, a quote. Uh, it's a bit of an old quote, um, but it does encompass a lot of the ideas that Stella was mentioning. And it's that um, a lot of people, when uh, when we first begin teaching study skills, and I myself um, started this way, um, is focusing on a knowledge of study skills, a knowledge of the technical elements, um, such as doing bibliographies or um, how to improve reading speed and and these these um, elements of actual academic life and we neglect um, the more uh, fundamental elements um, such as the underlying competence that is necessary for successful study and this is um, what Stella was touching on um, when she was talking about self-reflection and the importance of self-management um, so, you, as you can see, even though this, this quote um, comes from uh, quite a few years back now, um, it is a, an, an idea that has been uh, growing in importance um, and becomes more and more important. And I want to uh, look at the importance of it uh, in my talk today. So, um, I want to look at uh, three different uh, perspectives um, of study skills. So this is this is different from um, the APTS um, categorization of skills that Stella was looking at. Um, so there she was looking at 
the way that skills are categorized as in uh, the type of skill that is being practiced. Um, here, this is not looking at type of skill, but more perspectives on the skills. So um, which, uh, which view are you taking on the skills? So the first is the, the ground level, the micro level. And this is looking at each technical ability, each technical aspect of uh, an academic skill. Um, the next level is within the system itself. So once you understand all of the different elements of a system, then you need to be looking at the view of the system as you operate inside it. And the most common um, example of that is how a student engages with ideas and how they express their own ideas. So it makes sense that first um, you, need, you need to feel comfortable at a micro level at the technical abilities of, say, um, engaging with a complex text. And then you move up to an operational level where now that you are competent and confident with engaging with that text, then you can engage with the ideas and you can express your own ideas. But we also have the incredibly important macro level uh, where we're looking at the analysis of that system. So it isn't enough to operate inside a system. We actually have to look at the system itself and understand which parts of that system are working well for me as a student. And it's our responsibility as teachers to help our students to understand which elements of that system um, are helping them and which elements of the system they need to um, become stronger at and can use better to their ability. And this again touches on the idea of self-management and self-reflection and students understanding um, the system that they're working with. So I'm going to look through um, all of those perspectives in turn. Um, and I am going to uh, ask if that's okay um, for a little bit of uh, audience participation because of course uh, I am uh, a teacher with a, a background in ELT and we love that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to start uh, by looking at system elements. So uh, what are some elements of academic life that in your experience students often find challenging? And I'm thinking here of the actual um, technical aspects of being a student, of what students have to do. So think about the kind of things that students have to do on a regular basis um, that they will find um, difficult. And I can see that Amira has said critical thinking, uh, study skills, I can see Asma has written academic writing. Um, any other ideas? Uh, yes, the uh, transition between high school and university absolutely is a, is a big jump, as Tom has correctly identified there. Um, any other ideas? Sorry, my Arabic isn't fantastic, so I'm not entirely sure what that says. Um, okay, academic writing. Um, uh, okay, now lots of, lots of ideas of, okay, lexical skills and research, and with a big crying face, so obviously, uh, Kalud had a difficult problem with research, uh, and we, we've all experienced that. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, look at the first one um, that I had in mind, uh, which was uh, absolutely research and reading uh, difficult texts. Um, often the texts that we, we see at university um, use terms we've never seen before, discuss ideas we've never seen before, and perhaps one of the things that is really challenging is that they discuss these difficult ideas using these difficult terms in a very long and complicated way, uh, way of writing. Um, also, hearing and understanding information. So while it is difficult um, to read the research, also we are participating in lectures and seminars and we need to take in all of this information. Uh, 
finally, of course, remembering that information. Um, oh, yes, the decoding skills, that is important. And we, we will touch um, Samira on the decoding skills in, in the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so uh, remembering information is absolutely crucial uh, because it's all very well being able to understand all of the information that uh, we're taking in, but if we can't remember it when we need it, then uh, there's not a lot. Uh, we haven't really done much to, to help us in any exams or in any form of writing. So we're going to look at some um, different, um, different skills. And um, the first thing to touch upon is that one of the biggest problems that our customers in the Gulf region uh, face, according to our research, is text processing at speed. And, and this is um, the same idea as, as research that uh, was coming up in the chat. So in order to help uh, this in Skillful, uh, we have included, uh, as Stella pointed out, uh, many uh, study skills from her excellent book um, about ways to process long and complex text. Um, and each tip has activities which are related to the unit and students can complete those activities either in uh, the lesson itself or at home in order to um, develop that skill. Um, so um, some of the main study skills that can help students with, with dealing with research, with um, text processing, uh, with decoding, um, as Samira said, are, for example, uh, increasing reading speed. So um, increasing reading speed can be a, a technical um, challenge um, in terms of uh, being a, a, a physical a thing that you need to develop physically. Um, so you can see um, Stella's tip there first is uh, tracking, tracking the text with your finger. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad habit. Um, the, the issue is when people um, are familiar with running the finger from word to word. Um, so here Stella is suggesting um, running the figure down the page. Um, also, I have um, with my students um, run my finger diagonally down the page. And the whole point of that is that you then move from the word level um, to a sentence level or to a paragraph level. And all of a sudden you are considering big blocks of ideas, uh, big blocks of, of text and um, thinking about the idea level. Um, another important uh, feature, um, skill rather, is um, understanding the features of a text. So if you know that a text always has a, a bibliography uh, that you can turn to and you can see where the references are, or you know how to move around the index, this helps enormously. Um, I used to um, give lessons to students who were taking psychology. And one of the key elements of any psychology text, of course, is the abstract. So um, students would learn very quickly that they could read abstracts and understand whether it is worth reading the entire study or not. And all they needed to read was the first 100 words. They didn't have to read the entire study. And that may seem a very simple thing, but um, until you know that, you can waste a lot of time um, wading through the details of studies um, and not um, finding the key studies that you need to know. Um, and another very important element is building your academic vocabulary. And we're going to, uh, thank you, Tom, we're just, just about to touch on that. Um, and we're going to see on the next slide um, that vocabulary development uh, is a key feature. In fact, uh, in our global research um, on the Insights Index, um, it was listed as the first of the three most important features of the Skillful book. Um, and the um, Skillful, Skillful series uh, uses um, all uses the full range of the academic uh, word list um, that Avril Coxhead um, produced um, with the uh, 
with the Uni University of Wellington, um, and also uses uh, the Macmillan, Macmillan Red uh, Star system, so that you can see the frequency of um, the words. Um, so, uh, you can see that um, there are activities all throughout the books um, for the development of uh, topic and also incidental vocabulary. Um, and students are able to focus on the most valuable words by uh, looking at the frequency. So, uh, another study skill um, that is important is dealing with uh, very specialised information. Um, what students find hard is that not only are the concepts new, but also these new terms um, that exist. Uh, and in order to help them with this kind of information, um, one of the skills that they can develop is, of course, taking uh, useful notes, um, as well as uh, mind mapping concepts. So you can see there in the notes, um, there are circles and arrows um, and different elements underlined. And having that visual representation of the importance of ideas is something that students um, find very useful in developing as a habit. Um, I saw a question come in about allowing students to read related but easier text in order to help them understand a difficult one. And absolutely, I, I think that uh, scaffolding is uh, an incredibly important part of academic life. And it is, if someone is in the situation where they are building up um, their academic skills outside of actual university classes, then absolutely it does help to have um, either broken down texts or texts that have been scaffolded or texts that have been graded. Um, but it is important also to have practice with both elements. Um, and then something else um, that is always useful is for students to keep a record of the terms that they come across and the terms that they need to understand. And this can be a simple written record or it can be keeping interactive um, interactive uh, file cards um, or it can be um, keeping a record on their phone um, given that we are always moving around with our phones and just uh, using the, the notepad on on the phone um, with all of the different terms uh, means that uh, you can always um, have it at hand and you can practice it as you go along. So uh, now we're going to look at um, operating inside the uh, complete systems. So uh, again, I'm going to ask you a question. So what do you think that students find hard about operating inside academic systems? And here I'm thinking about the tasks that they need to do. So um, if you um, think about um, Stellar system of APTS, uh, these would be the task skills, so giving and, and listening to presentations or uh, giving and listening to seminars or essays. Uh, productive tasks, I can see is coming, is coming up. So absolutely, yeah, public speaking would be included as a form of, uh, as an, an example of a productive task. Presenting projects. Yeah. Okay, presentations, essays, and compositions. Okay, fantastic. So um, let's have a look. So, uh, just a second. Struggling with my monitors here. Okay, so uh, analyze, to, to break this down into um, its widest components, um, really it's the analyzing ideas and expressing ideas. So, um, Everyone was mentioning um, all of the productive um, tasks, um, such as giving seminars and essays, and of course this is expressing ideas, but also it is important to consider analysing ideas and dealing with the ideas of others. 
So one of the major features uh, of academic life is understanding the key concepts and theories of the field. Um, this involves identifying experts and becoming familiar with their ideas. Now, one of the things that I have uh, always seen with students is that one thing is understanding um, what the experts are saying. And another thing entirely is learning to question those ideas. Um, often students feel very uncomfortable when they have spent a long time identifying who the experts are and what the ideas are that these experts uh, provide. And then suddenly they are asked to question and query uh, those same ideas. Uh, and they feel uncomfortable because they're only just learning um, how those ideas are formed and suddenly they have to be um, uh, criticizing them and, and pulling them apart. So this is something that we definitely need to support them with. Um, so study skills here are um, thinking critically and thinking critically could involve, for example, um, taking multiple perspectives so that um, you're not simply criticizing a, an expert but you are looking at an expert's opinion, an expert's idea from a different perspective and seeing whether or not it works in that perspective. Um, so for example, um, the ideas of Freud, uh, many people criticized him um, because his ideas uh, worked very well for uh, middle upper class society uh, in, in in his town and, and in Europe, but they didn't really uh, work so well uh, in other aspects of society and certainly not across the world. Um, another study skill is conceptualizing concepts and their limits. So um, understanding uh, where, where concepts came up with, um, the, the timeline, um, the environment that the person was in when they had those ideas, but also uh, what those limits are. That uh, ideas um, belong to a particular time period and they don't always extend well into other time periods and other eras. And I think that is uh, more true today than it has been in the past. And the key one um, that has always uh, becoming mentioned again and again and again is evaluating sources of information. Um, we've had huge discussions about fake news and um, about the importance of new sources and we can see that um, now this is becoming more and more and more important and even questioning the validity of images and videos is, is becoming important now. And then um, the one that um, many people are most concerned with, and uh, I can see in the chat that people are talking about productive tasks, is that um, students want to learn to express their own ideas. And it's one thing to know uh, what you want to say, but it is another thing entirely knowing how exactly to say it, especially if you're having to uh, say it in a completely new uh, way of speaking, um, as typically uh, an academic way of speaking is for the majority of our students. So um, to help them express themselves with confidence, um, students can place new perspectives on the existing ideas. So uh, that means that it isn't the case that they have to come up with something that is completely groundbreaking, but um, they have to look at an idea in a way that is new because it, uh, it has never been considered from their perspective before. And I think this is something that we are seeing um, nowadays that um, people, new, pers new perspectives are, are coming out in media. And finally, we are getting a, a range of uh, different views on traditional ideas that have uh, existed up to now. 
Um, also, uh, building supporting reasons for ideas. So um, here you can see uh, a tip from Stella uh, in the book, uh, where she looks at um, persuading people through reason. So um, this was the idea of uh, persuasion, one of her uh, people tasks, uh, and how it is crucial to um, come up with a range of different reasons in order to persuade and influence others. Um, and another uh, way to um, express an idea is to take an established framework, um, but then put your idea in it. So um, the pe people are kind of have that um, blank page feeling when uh, they need to come up with something and they feel that it has to be uh, groundbreaking, it has to be completely new. But you can take uh, an established way of thinking and then you can um, add a new twist to it or add a new um, element to it that people haven't considered before. Now we're gonna to come to um, probably the, the most uh, important um, element of uh, operating inside the system, and that is analyzing the system and analyzing um, how you use it. So how do you think um, students will know which parts of a system they most engage with and which parts of the system will be the most motivating for them? Um, could you uh, pop in chat any ideas that you have um, that you think uh, would help your students to know those? elements while I have a quick sip of water. Absolutely, teamwork, peer work is incredibly important. Deductive reasoning, sure. Competitions, yeah, I mean, it does require a variety of strategies, that is, uh, that is unquestionable. Personal dreams, interesting. So yeah, so we will we will look at goal setting um, and um, establishing um, the, the aim uh, of your work. Good, okay. So um, the first one, of course, is reviewing performance. Um, yep, and, okay, so analyzing contrastively. Yep, so uh, um, comparing uh, your, perform your current performance with the performance before. Um, and also reviewing your development, um, seeing uh, not only um, how you are currently performing, but also seeing how you have improved. So we're going to uh, look at some of those elements. So students, as you know, um, are always um, very, very focused on the results of a performance. So this could be number grades, this could be letter grades, this could be um, feedback from teachers. However, to really engage with the learning process, it's just as important, if not arguably more important, for students to develop self-analysis and review their own performance and what it means to them. So ways for students to consider their performance could include, um, as mentioned, cross-comparing your work. So that could be um, comparing your work with others, but it also could be comparing the work of this month with the work of the previous month and see how you are improving. Um, also analysing the work of peers and exemplars. Um, having an exemplar is incredibly helpful. So um, going, to, going to the library and looking for um, the, uh, the final work, uh, the final essays um, that students have produced. And um, if, if, you're, if your university keep, keeps um, a record of all of, all of the printed um, thesis, for example, you can have a look at different styles of thesis um, and see the grades that they got. And you can uh, use those not uh, as 
as uh, inspiration, but also as an example of the style that you could adopt. Um, I can see a suggestion also of uh, writing weekly journals. And I think that is another good way of um, reflecting and thinking about your work. Um, so as we can see, reflective, reflective learning, <laughs> uh, reflective learning um, is crucial and uh, um, it does uh, affect your attitude and it uh, affects your ideas um, and also helps you to identify anything um, that is blocking your learning and anything that uh, you need, any kind of skill that you need to develop. Um, I chuckled because I, I saw uh, a comment from Adir um, that it could be depressing if the student's level was not improving. Potentially, yes. Um, however, I think you need to, uh, that student would need to think about um, what is meant by improvement. So if the improvement is they are getting the same letter grade or the same number grade, then they need to have a look and see which elements they in which elements they have improved because it will be very unlikely unless they haven't engaged with the um, the subject at all that there hasn't been any change so perhaps um, they are improving in their writing style but they are not improving in the way they analyze um, the way they analyze the ideas um, so they can have a conversation with their teacher and they can see which elements they have improved in. And I think that's where weekly journals is incredibly helpful. Um, so now we're gonna uh, move um, over to uh, Tom's suggestion of self-development goals and action plans. So um, it isn't enough to simply review performance. Uh, it is crucial, um, as Tom has suggested, to um, set goals and analyze anything that is blocking you in order to achieve those goals. So to be a, a fully actualized student, um, you need to see uh, the things that motivate you. Uh, and you need to identify an end goal. And then you need to create an action plan that helps you to achieve that goal. Um, so, um, as you can see here, you've got um, the, the steps that you want to take and um, you've got the different dates and you've got the completion dates. Um, you could do this as a weekly journal and you could reflect on what you are doing in order to achieve a particular goal. Um, also, it's very important that those end goals are not absolutely enormous uh, kind of um, the, the aspirational dreams. So if your end goal is achieving the highest grade possible or speaking fluent English or um, earning a six figure salary, um, then that isn't detailed enough um, to prevent you from comparing and despairing. Uh, what you really need to have is a goal which is very, very clear and, and is um, focused enough so that you know if you are moving towards it. So um, these are all of the, all of the three perspectives, but um, something important to mention is that these three perspectives are not developed one after the other. So it isn't a process where you work first on the elements of a system and then you operate in the system and then you reflect on the system. Um, as you are learning the technical elements, you need to be operating in that system because you are already expected to read text and to express your ideas. As you do that, you also need to be reflecting on how well you have um, come up with those ideas, how well you have expressed yourself. So all three perspectives um, are operating at the same time. And it's confidence with the system elements, it's the usage of the systems, and it's the, an understanding of how you benefit from those systems 
that will help students to not only achieve what they want, but also enjoy the process of achieving it. And I think that's what all of us, and certainly um, the publishing team of Skillful, absolutely uh, want from our students. Thank you very much. Dan, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Again, such an interesting uh, subject, you know, getting into the, it, the inter, I was going to use integral, integrated way of my, my brain isn't working now. So I'm getting that. You should be taking a lot in. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like, yeah, it's so much information. And then people are writing here, look, so informative. Um, I was looking for some questions. So people were so interactive with the, with the content. So it was really nice to have that, that change in dynamics. Uh, everybody was so involved, which, which is fantastic. Loads of great comments. Um, having a look at some of them now. I was trying to think of some questions as we, as we were going. I mean, in, I, I think one of the things that was really clear for me was that these study skills, they can be made explicit and they can be scaffolded, right? That, I think that's the, the message that really is coming across, that we can plan for them, we can integrate them into lessons, we can integrate them into content um, and, and to scaffold along the way. I was trying to think, do you think, um, you know, I, was, I, I do a lot of stuff with young learners, you know, and we use a lot of mm -hmm. scaffolding strategies, things like I, we, you, you know, that's a very popular sure. one. Do you think some of these strategies sometimes get lost when we get to kind of young adults and adult learners? I feel like there's a psychology with young yeah. adults that you, you're an adult now, you're smart, you, I should be able to just tell you this. And you do you think that Absolutely. we need, maybe do you think we need to take some of those, you know, I'm thinking of things like, let's take play-based learning. Okay, we don't want young adults to be playing in the same way that, you know, I'd go out into the yard and run around. I'm not talking about that. But some of the psychological aspects of what students get from play-based learning, collaboration, problem solving, interaction, sharing. Do you think that we need to reevaluate some of the strategies that we use with, with this age group? I, I do, I, that's, that's a really good um, I mean, I, I don't think we would expect um, adults to be playing, but having a playful, um, a playful approach to, to a task, I think is important. And for example, you know, if you had to write an essay and you could write an essay in any way you, you wanted to, and in using any convention you wanted to, and you just, the only task you had to do was express yourself. Um, and then you could look at the ideas that came out in that and then say, okay, look, these are really helpful and helpful and valuable ideas. Now, the way that's typically expected to express yourself is this way. Now let's take those same ideas and put them in there, but at least you've had the opportunity to play with the ideas mm. and allow them to come out. And that's, um, part of, that's part of the scaffolding strategy, right? I is think so, yeah, absolutely. You, you give them models, you let them do it in their own way, be as creative sure. as they want, and then you channel what they've actually created to meet some of the outcomes that you want them to meet, I guess. So. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think, think, yeah, sorry, I think go on. I was, no, I was going to say that um, Stella, in, in one of her first slides, um, talks about this idea of in, intrinsic strength. And I thought that was a very interesting idea that, um, I, I still think there's a hangover in in the ac in academic life that we expect adults to be um, to be mentally strong and to have yeah. this um, very high IQ or very high moral fiber was the term that she used um, and that they have to be intrinsically strong and I think it is much more about intrinsic motivation. They need, they need to have a, a passion for it and they need to have a deep interest in the subject. Mm. And that will develop their strength. That will help them to become um, stronger thinkers, more critical thinkers, more self-reflective, um, aware of their own skills. But if they don't have that passion, they don't have that drive, then they're not, they're not gonna arrive there. 
and and that's our role. Our, our role is is to make sure that they are interested and, and, and engaged with the subject. Yeah, that that element of uh, of confidence building that kind of runs right through everything that we're doing. In fact, I would say that's actually true for teachers as well. Thinking about teachers that I've observed at this age level, young adults, I think having confidence to do things differently is at, is also very difficult. I think at this age group, you know, you take pre-primary primary teachers and you tell them to do something new. They might be a bit nervous, but they usually kind of go for it with their students. Sure. But in with young adults, you know, university, it, it's it's very easy to say well, everyone's lecturing. I should be lecturing. This yeah. is the way it's always been done. It, it's, it's because there's this perception of stakes that, that, that mm -hmm. the stakes are so high. Yeah. Um, that there isn't this this space to, to play and, and to, to yeah. experiment with things. But yeah. yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's crucial. Yeah, it's so fascinating, so fascinating. Okay, I'm I'm gonna move along. There was loads of other questions. I will actually pluck a lot of these questions out, um, and maybe again in the follow-up email uh, we can address some of them as well. Uh, but I know that Tom is waiting for us. Dan, thanks so much again for such Thank an you. interesting session. Uh, it was wonderful. Everybody really enjoyed it. Um, and if I can ask you to stop screen sharing, I will invite Tom to share his screen, and we'll move on to the final session. It's again then. Tom, are you with us still? There he is. Hi, Nathan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tom. How are you doing this evening? Good, thank you. Excellent. I hope you found everything so far uh, as interesting as I have. I'm sure you have. Really great content, yeah. Yeah, amazing, right? Okay, so uh, I want to get moving because uh, obviously we're running a little bit over schedule. So let me introduce Tom. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know who Tom is, but uh, Tom Kittle is the director uh, for Norwich uh, Institute of Language Education, or NILE, ELT. He's a uh, chair of the Equals Board of Trustees, and he's a founding director of the Association of Quality Education and Training Online, which is otherwise known as Aquaduto. He has been working with learners, teachers, and trainers for 25 years in the areas of language learning, pedagogy, digital technologies, language assessment, and teacher training. So Tom, I know you've got so much experience and you've got a load of things that you're gonna share with us, and I'm super excited to hear about it. And I will pass the baton to you, and I will again collect questions for the end. Best of luck, and I will speak to you soon. Brilliant. Thank you, Nathan. Hello, everybody. I'm coming to you um, live from Norwich in the, the east of England um, from the Nile offices. Uh, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned at the start of this uh, symposium, we've worked with uh, universities, uh, particularly King Abdulaziz University and, and Princess Nouri University for, for many years. And um, we've been partners with Macmillan strategically for many years as well. And so this brings things together very nicely for me. I want to broaden things out a little bit from um, uh, the excellent presentations from Stella and Dan um, to think about the implications of some of what they've said. Uh, unless you're a, um, already a model of best practice of integration of uh, these study skills within your institution, um, you've probably got some thoughts running through your head now about how and when and what and to whom and with whom um, these kind of uh, changes and innovations within your curriculum and classroom practice might be implemented, might be integrated. Um, and I want to look at that, that idea of innovation in language education, which Nathan usefully um, uh, made into a four-word title. My original title was uh, the aim to embed classroom and curriculum innovation across the whole language teaching organization, your ELIs, your ELCs, one of the challenges and opportunities, but uh, I think the, the, the bite size of uh, innovation in, in language education does just as well, because really we're talking about um, the need for, for innovation, to, to embrace some of these ideas that uh, have been um, researched and produced and have been around for, for a number of years, but are gaining more and more importance and more and more traction as we see the impact of employability on, on students. We see the impact of their needs as they move from uh, preparatory programs into um, into their faculty programs. We see the, the needs in the globalized world and particularly how they, they uh, 
work within teams and, and uh, across teams and across countries and continents. And what does this mean for, for us as educational institutions when we're trying to, to adapt and adopt uh, innovative practices, uh, whether that's complete revolution in terms of what we do, or whether that's a gradual evolution, it's still a, a developmental journey. And we've all been through an enforced developmental journey over the last two years. And uh, with any developmental journey, you've probably found some some friction, you've probably found some moments of success, you've, I'm sure you've found some challenges to cope with there. If you think of a particular in innovation or, or change in your practice in the classroom or, or in academic management or whatever uh, place within your institution you are, you can probably identify some of these um, characteristics, some of these moments of, of challenge and uh, doubt or success um, in, in that development journey as you, you adapted to uh, changing realities, to, to impositions of new rules, to, to different ways of working with your colleagues, to w different ways of working with your students. Um, hopefully none of you have jumped off the, the bridge as yet. I'm sure because you're here in this webinar that means you're, you're part of that process of development and personal development and professional development and institutional development, um, which is a very positive thing. But we know that there are um, different stages within this journey. And we know that for any innovation, there's going to be peaks and troughs. This is a, a lovely um, transition psychology uh, graph from the, from the 1960s, but still it captures that idea that um, within that journey of development, of, of innovation, of, of evolution within a, a, any institution or individual, there's going to be different moments at which we feel the excitement of the, the first flush of new uh, possibility, the, the adjustment, the, the honeymoon period perhaps, or, or minimizing the impact of that change and denial of it to some of those moments of, of crisis where we think, is this really working? Is this producing the results we wanted? Am I doing right here? And hopefully rebuilding and, and reconstruction and recovery from that so it becomes embedded and becomes part of a system and part of professional practice in a way that you'd want it to be. Um, so at different stages with innovation in education institutions, we need to be aware of this uh, challenge and change going through. and We need to be aware of how the institution and the individuals within it will respond to it. Because, of course, we have an institutional attitude, but we also have a, a, a mix of individual attitudes towards that. And individual attitudes that might be um, encapsulated in some of these uh, animal metaphors that I've borrowed from my, my friend and colleague Rod Belitho, um, who some of you may have heard of. The re reactions to change when we, when we innovate, when we try and bring something new into our classroom practice or into our curriculum or into our, uh, our systems in some other way. Um, how do different individuals react? Maybe in the chat you can share if you know the names of some of these animals because they're not always easy to, to name. Um, but as we're doing that, think about the hedgehog. What's their reaction to the threat of change? Well, they roll up into a ball and they put the spikes out. We know that in our staff rooms, in our, in our colleagues, there are, there are people who might respond in this quite negative way to any innovation to change, that don't come near me with this new innovation, leave me alone. I was doing fine before, my students were doing fine before, they were getting good results in the program. So we need to be aware of this kind of resistance to change amongst potential colleagues with, with innovation practices. Look at the, the eagle in the bottom left, the individual who wants to fly up to 10,000 feet and just survey the scene and let other people try this out first. Decide a little bit whether it's going to work before they take a plunge in there, before they commit themselves. They want to see the lie of the land before they embrace a change. What about the mayfly in the middle at the top? The mayfly only lives for a day. Is this the, the colleague who responds to an innovation by saying, well, this won't last long. I've just got to worry about this for a day or two and then it will be forgotten and there'll be some new innovation. Or is it the chameleon on the far right, the individual who responds with, well, outwardly, I'll change my practice. I'll talk the talk in the staff room. I'll say the right things to my academic manager, but inside in my classroom practice, I'm not going to do anything different because I'm comfortable with the way I work. Or is it the dinosaur in the bottom right who says, what change, innovation, I'm retiring in two years anyway, it's not going to affect me, so I'm not going to make any changes. So we know that with any innovation, with any 
educational reform, with any change to, to curricula or classroom practice, there's going to be resistance. And, and as academic managers, as senior teachers, as, as colleagues responsible for mentoring, bringing in new teachers, we have to be aware and ready to deal with this resistance because it's part of any organisation, but it's particularly a part of educational organisations where we sometimes are removed from, from seeing the classroom practices, from, from actually what goes on behind the classroom door for all of our, our teacher training workshops and our suggestions and our staff meetings. Do we know what's going on within those teachers' classrooms and, and how uh, the more resistant colleagues might be responding to that? Of course, there'll be teachers who embrace change and who see the value of this. And maybe you can think of uh, the animal metaphor for those who really embrace change rather than resist it. Um, so where might, where might innovation come from? Well, it might be that your institution has decided to change the course, but it may be that there's a new course that's um, been brought to teachers that implies and implicates a, a change in the way people uh, use the, the materials in their classroom or adapt materials from this to, to work with their students. It might be a redesign of the curriculum to, to integrate more, um, more fundamentally study skills, for example. It may be that you've been asked to work with a new technological tool. Maybe that's a move to online learning or a, a different platform you've been used before, and, and that needs innovation and adaptation and change. It may be a change in the methodological approach, um, uh, a change in the way that the, the uh, classes are, are set up, the change in the way you're expected to work with the students. It may be that the innovation is, is driven by uh, an external framework of reference, maybe an alignment to a particular set of standards, uh, changes in those standards whether that's on a local level within your institution or or, or a national um, uh, a national adoption of, of standards or, or international such as alignment to the, the common european framework it may be that um, it's the student's profile or the student's needs as we've been hearing from uh, the external side the students need these new skills they need these uh, to develop these existing skills and that's causing innovation and the, the challenge to to uh, to change and reform and, and adapt within uh, the teaching body it may be a new management approach is part of that and um, we need to to adapt to that and there may be other reasons which drive innovation uh, in your context. I'm sure you can think of others uh, within that, um, whether that's external, internal, individual or institutional. I think the key thing to remember and where I'm really going with this in this session today is that there needs to be an understanding that any innovation, any change within a particular aspect of classroom practice or curriculum or materials has a ripple effect. And one small change will affect other parts of the system, will affect other practices in other parts of the, uh, the educational institution. And we can't allow ourselves to, to imagine that changing one aspect of our practice will not have an impact on other aspects of the educational institution. In fact, the opposite, we need to prepare for that and we need to be ready for those impacts on other aspects of the way educational institutions are, are structured. And I think this is the key that we need to keep in mind. We know that the fundamental layer of support will need to come from academic and institutional management to resource, to empower, to promote, to exemplify, to, to, uh, to resource the change, the innovation, and the practices involved with it. But that will also affect other, perhaps separate departments or separate teams within a department, which can't be forget forgotten. It, take any one of these pillars away and the end result is doomed to failure. We need to be able to consider the impact of a change on the curriculum and syllabus team. Those people who are looking at pacing are looking at integration of, of new aspects or new skill focuses within the syllabus and the, and the plan over, uh, over the semesters and over the, the programme. We need to understand the impact of these changes on materials design and development. If we're introducing a new component into the curriculum, what are the implications for the materials we use? Are they there in the form of a, a new course book? Are they needing to be adapted from a previous set of uh, teaching materials? Are there new creation of materials needed to support the teachers and to support the students to, to, to adopt this new innovation? What's the impact 
on the assessment. How do we design our assessments to reflect the curriculum and the, the syllabus aims and the, the intended learning outcomes? And how do we value those changes within the classroom practice through the assessment practices? How do we give that value through the, um, the summative assessment through, uh, sorry, at the end of a course or the formative assessment during a course that makes learners feel these have value in, in the way that Stella was talking about, of talking about it, raising visibility of these changes, showing how they're integrated and showing their value. Very often in many education institutions and in students' minds, value is given by um, by goals and by outcomes and by assessment and by qualifications and passing and failing. So we need to make sure that the assessment is, is tailored towards um, the curriculum and syllabus outcomes and also reflects the materials that students are using, the tasks they're working on. So these first three pillars, all about that kind of structural element of um, how the how the educational institution adapts to this change. And that needs to be shared with the teachers with, with appropriate and ongoing teacher training. Perhaps if it's a new innovation, that's real top-down teacher training to, to showcase the new approach, or perhaps it's ongoing professional development for the, for the teaching team and mentoring of new teachers coming in there to support um, their adaptation of this change and, and the innovations that you're going to ask them to do in their classroom practice. Because the end goal of this is that the communication of the change and the, the way in which students work with that and the way in which teachers work with that and the way in which other colleagues within the educational institution work with that is clear and consistent and has the, the same goal at the end. The, the teams need to be working in line with any innovation in a um, in an educational institution because otherwise they'll be moving at uh, different in di different directions or at different paces and there'll be a lack of coherence between the uh, the approaches in different teams and that causes confusion among teachers which obviously translates into confusion for students about what we're supposed to be doing now and how we're going to be uh, measured on this and how valuable this is seen within our institution um, fortunately in our uh, work at Nile, we've been able to respond to these challenges and um, we have developed a number of, of programs to support uh, teachers in educational institutions, working with um, teachers in uh, dozens of countries around the world with, with thousands of teachers. We have uh, well over a thousand teachers studying with us right now um, from over 60 different countries um, and really addressing some of these individual issues. And just to to show you some of these courses that are available, uh, particularly if you're a Macmillan customer or a potential Macmillan customer, to know that these programs are there for you, either as individual teachers or managers within an institution or as institutional packages to support your professional development and your uh, adaptation to innovation and, um, innovation and change. We have courses on academic management. So the management in language education course really talks about how you can support these different aspects of um, change within your institution, with structure, with systems, with alignment to, to international standards, to manage the people in your team, to manage the performance of teachers in your team, to manage the quality of what you're offering, and particularly to manage change, innovation, and adaptation within an institution. There are courses for Curriculum development, specifically focusing on how to develop a, a curriculum that's aligned to international or national standards, uh, what components might be within that, how they can be uh, overlapped and combined to make sure there's cross-curricular approaches to, to understand the relationship between learning objectives and learning outcomes and assessment within um, uh, within a syllabus, and to, to map this um, support against the external framework if that's part of your um, needs and remit within a, a syllabus and curriculum design team. There are courses on materials development, how to um, build your own materials, how to evaluate existing materials, how to adapt existing materials, how to supplement materials, how to choose the right course book for your educational institution, for the innovation that's coming, um, for the, the evolution of change within your institution. There are courses on assessment design for how to make the testing, evaluation, assessment processes, systems, procedures, align with the curriculum, align with the teaching, align with the learning, and so that there's that consistency in all, all parts of the engine, all the rowers in the boat are pulling at the same time and in the same direction. 
And of course, in terms of teacher development, there are specific courses for different levels of teachers. This one for teachers of English for academic purposes, you can see in the course content there has a particular focus on teaching study skills as part of this um, academic uh, purposes approach within many of the, uh, the educational institutions that I know many of you represent. So there's all sorts of um, possibilities here within um, the, the teacher development, but also you need to develop the, the teacher's support within your institution because teacher support, teacher mentoring, uh, teacher uh, insets and training and professional development within the institution, that also needs to be developed among your staff to give them the capacity to, to have sustainability. Um, and to take these ideas of, of change and, and work with teachers in a, in a systematic way. So we have courses on becoming a teacher trainer and becoming an expert teacher trainer uh, to support colleagues in the institution, to support this embracing of um, innovation, to support this, this change management process within classroom practice or within assessment practice or, or curriculum design. So all of these um, courses are available uh, from Nile in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Macmillan Education. Uh, if you're a Macmillan customer, or you can contact your Macmillan representative to talk about how this can uh, aid your institution to, to support teachers thinking about innovations in terms of, of study skills being integrated into your uh, into your curriculum, into your classroom practice. Because our our goal is to support you with this Nile motto, this slogan that we need to give um, teachers practitioners and uh, administrators and managers within institutions, roots and wings, the roots to have the, the confidence that what they're doing is well resourced and is well structured and is principled and the decision making process has been effective, but also the wings to, to fly and to, to innovate and be creative in the classroom to, to adapt this to their own students needs, which are, let's be honest, the teacher knows best the profiles and the needs and the strengths and the, the weaknesses of the, the students they work with day to day. So we have to have these fundamental roots of institutional organization and professional development support in order to give the wings for the, the teachers to fly in the classrooms and be the best teachers they can be. Um, so please do talk to your Macmillan representative or, or look at um, the Macmillan uh, um, uh, opportunities or the Nile website if to see if these courses could be useful for you or the institution you work with. If you want to take a little dip in to uh, some of the work that Nile does, uh, there's a completely free set of Nile resources through our Nile membership area. You can click on Nile membership, sign up for a free account, sign into our members area, and you get access to all sorts of great resources, uh, articles, webinars, special tools for aligning to the CEFR, special text analysis tools which allow um, allow you to look at the vocabulary within a particular text and, and then build a, a corpus interface from that so you can see how particular vocabulary is being used, its collocational relationships within a, uh, within a whole individual text. So all these tools completely free uh, on the Nile website. So I encourage you to, to dive in, to have a look around, to see uh, what might suit you and to contact us if you feel that there's um, particular uh, strategic uh, professional development support you'd like from this collaboration between Nile and um, Macmillan Education. So do dive in, do take that opportunity and um, do remember that this is something that's an ongoing process. Perhaps the, the wisest person on the bridge from the, the start is this one I've coloured in red. What do you think this person is saying to his colleagues still on the bridge? Well, could be saying many things, could be celebrating his own success, but I think this character is saying, hey guys, over there, there's another bridge. And this is an ongoing process and a development process and Niall Macmillan Education and Saudi TESOL very much would like to be part of supporting you in that process. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you to, to Nathan and team for setting this up. Um, thank you to, to Stella and Dan for your sessions. And I hope this idea of taking innovation on a very practical level into the educational institution has given you some food for thought. Tom, thank you so much. I think uh, he's, he's got a smile on his face, but I'm sure that the next bridge is probably twice the size of the one that they're looking at now, with a few, few of the boards missing as well, probably. That's how we feel, I think, sometimes.
Well, it's probably a rickety rope bridge if the last two years have done anything to go by, isn't it? Yes, I think you're probably right. Thank you so much again. Everyone, an outpouring of love there in the in the chat box. Everybody is really thankful for, for the content of that session, and I think it's really great to see that there is, you know, so much support for both teachers and for schools to embrace change and you know innovation, you know, and, and I guess generally evaluate the efficacy of what they're they're doing each and every day. Right, we're all going in. We want it to be meaningful. You know, reevaluating that. I think I think doing it as a school, I think is 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 vitally important. I think there's nothing harder than trying to change within education by yourself as a teacher. I, I think there's so many so many roadblocks to that approach. I think you really need to get everybody on board um, and be communicative about it. Um, so it's really great to see that there are these courses that people can that schools can also sign up to um, to take advantage of that. So I think that cross um, cross pollination of ideas within a within an educational organisation is so valuable. It's it's where we learn our best teaching ideas. It's where we share our, our woes and our worries and get support for them. And that that learning community that you can form within a school or within a a, a language centre, I think, is really valuable. Yeah, and, and they're your first source of support. I think most people probably get a lot of their professional development from interacting with colleagues getting their ideas, sharing activities, uh, reflecting on something that you gave me and I've done it with my students. And I thought, actually, I could change it a little bit like this and then I give it back to you. And you know, I think that informal CPD happens a lot. So uh, people sh should embrace that, I think. Uh, people really love that graph. Um, so hopefully I can get a copy of that and share it with people. Um, because they, they really loved it. And people really love the, the animals as well, you know, seeing the different personalities, but within the same environment, um, somebody feels like most people are chameleons, or there's a lot of chameleons as teachers, but I think there's probably actually a variety of, of all of them. Um, they could be one other, but come across as a chameleon. Maybe they're being a hedgehog, but pretending to be something else. I don't know, maybe there's some yeah, other. Yeah, I think it's like with learning styles. We don't want to put anybody into one particular <laughs> box and assume that they're, they're that for, forever. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I would like uh, to have a, a subsequent slide, which is those teacher personalities that really adapt well. Um, I did it once in a technology course, and then the, uh, the suggestion was for a spider because they're good on the web. But I don't know if that one works. So yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I, there was, I don't know if it was a comment in the, in the chat, but somebody was asking something about, um, you know, there's a lot of online learning that's been going on because of COVID, but there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of change around uh, technology. Do you think there's an over-reliance on technology now, or do you should we em fully embrace it? I know several years ago people were they didn't they were kind of hesitant to to embrace technology fully. There was still this you know I, I want them to learn from books and paper and I don't has that changed? Have students changed that? Well, the genie's out of the bottle in a certain way um, because the emergency response to the pandemic has has forced so many people to go so much faster into aspects of um, technology mediated delivery of learning and assessment of learning um, and I think personally that probably has been a bit too fast you know we haven't had the time for the the classroom practice research to filter through to to yeah. models of good practice in particular contexts and for particular students but students now have expectations about what can be done well online, what can be resourced well online, and what really needs to be done face to face. And I think that what we'll see uh, as the kind of consolidation uh, of an emergency response moving into future proofing and resilience is going to be that cherry picking of what works well and what really is done best face to face. And there's so much about um, language education in particular that needs that face-to-face -face communication, I think, to, to be really developed as, as well as we want it to be. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be so interesting in the next few years, I think, uh, the, the, the longer term impact, as you've just said. I, I think that I, I feel like students might become more demanding of how we spend their time. I feel like that might come in, become a, a big discussion. You know, it's certain things like, you know, we're so used to doing listening activities in class, standard speed. And yet people, when they've been doing it either in a flipped classroom or they've been doing it themselves online, I, I've heard that most students actually listen to listening passages 
at, at a higher speed. They go to like 1.4 or 1.7, you know, and they, they kind of prefer that. I've, I've heard this come up several times. So I wonder whether or not they'll start coming back to class and start saying to teachers, we want to do it this way because actually we found out that we prefer it because we've been doing it this way online. It'll be really interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think there'll be the same perspectives from teachers and teachers will be thinking, well, you know, I want to do this and I want to bring this into my class. So I want this to be a feature of it. What we have to guard against, again, taking that institutional perspective is what are the implications on teachers' workload and time for this? Because it's all very well saying, well, you can all upload a sample um, speaking activity onto this platform and you can do it in your own time and you can rehearse it and you repeat it. But when does the teacher get to listen to those and feedback effectively on those without the, the recompense for doing that or the time allowance for doing that. If it's not happening in a 90 minute face to face class, that has implications on timetabling, curriculum planning as well. Yeah, absolutely. Again, Tom, thanks so much for uh, spending this time with us this evening. It's been uh, really, really interesting to, to hear these ideas and see some of these things. Definitely. Um, highlighting the, the Macmillan and Nile relationship, the, the opportunities um, to go through Macmillan. I mean, one of them is the fact that um, we offer a discount um, to Nile courses if it's booked through the Macmillan education team. So, you know, and again, I can put that in the follow-up email as well. But thanks very much for this evening. Um, and before people leave, I do have a few extra things that I would like to, to highlight. Before I do that, though, again, I would like to really thank the all of the speakers from this evening. Trying to see Stella's right. I cannot multitask. One thing at a time, everybody. I'd like to thank so much uh, our speakers for this evening, uh, Stella Cottrell, um, and obviously we've got Barry there, but we had Dan with us um, with a fabulous session uh, on Skillful. And of course, Tom with the innovation session as well. Thank you to all three of them. Um, and thanks to Dr. Abdullah for his uh, opening statement at the very beginning, and also for Saudi TESOL for collaborating with us on this event. For those of you who were not with us at the beginning, we did have a couple of, of announcements. As I mentioned at the very beginning, you will all get a certificate um, automatically in the next few days. Uh, check your spam folder. I'll be sending them from the MENA PD Academy email, not from the Macmillan Education email, because this is a local event. So they might end up in your spam if you've not had an email from us in the past. And we will put together a virtual goodie bag with some of the content, um, maybe uh, some giveaways as well. Some useful things for you in class, hopefully. Tomorrow, I will put the recording of this session onto the YouTube page, the MenaPD Academy by Macmillan Education, so you can go and watch anything that you may have missed. Uh, I'll repeat this one. This is an event or a symposium uh, organized by the MenaPD Academy by Macmillan Education in the MENA team. I did have a nice animation. There was me at the very beginning. I am Nathan. I'm the teacher trainer for Macmillan Education in MENA. And we are using the Professional Development Academy, the MENA PD Academy, to further our advancing learning themes um, and professional development opportunities across the MENA region. So get in touch with us. Look us up, MENA PD Academy. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Twitter. We even have a professional development website, which is only just been launched, so it's still pretty small but we're updating it with content pretty much every week. And we've got loads of activities, webinars, podcasts, blogs coming up. And obviously connect with our partners, our event partners this evening as well. We've obviously been partnering with Niall, who is an official Macmillan Education partner. Um, so they've got loads of professional development opportunities, as Tom just uh, informed us about. We've also been uh, partnering for this with Bloomsbury Publishing, um, and we would definitely recommend going and checking out all of the life skills uh, and study skills uh, titles that they publish. There's ones on critical thinking, there's the 50 Way series, loads of great titles to give you great ideas in your classrooms. And of course, we've been collaborating uh, with Saudi TESOL, the largest uh, professional development organization in Saudi Arabia. And we're really thankful to those guys for partnering with us 
as well this evening. You saw a load of stuff from Skillful Second Edition. This is our Academic English Paired Skills Young Adult course. Uh, go and check it out um, at MacmillanEnglish.com. Uh, it's a very scaf uh, carefully scaffolded approach to language and skills development. It's got Reuters content. And of course, all of that stuff that Stella was talking about is integrated into the content of Skillful to make it nice and easy for you to use and integrate into the classroom and into your students' learning. Before I say goodnight, right at the very end, don't forget our Global Teachers Festival starting on the 14th of February. Uh, go to mamillanenglish.com and on the homepage you'll see you can enter the home, the hub for the Global Teachers Festival. You can see all of the different types of sessions that are going on. Two weeks, professional development. I'm pretty sure there's something in there for absolutely everybody. So go in there. In fact, there's a video from Will. I will finish with this. From me, though, good night, everybody. Thanks again to all of our um, guests. Thanks to our collaborators. And thank you all for being with us throughout this evening. I hope you found it as interesting and as enlightening as I have. I've actually got a lot of things to go away and think about based on this. And I hope you guys do too. So from me, good night. And I will leave you. Uh, with this video from Will. Good night, everybody. Are you interested in developing your skills as a teacher of English? Do you want a wide range of topics to choose from and the option to attend a live webinar at a time that suits your busy teaching schedule? Then you'll be glad to hear that the Advancing Learning Global Teachers Festival from Macmillan Education is back for another series of world-leading teacher training delivered by expert speakers from all over the world daily from the 14th to the 25th of February 2022. We've talked on areas like global citizenship education, literacy, exam skills, psychological research and ELT, thinking skills, collaborative learning, well-being and loads more. I can assure you there is something for everyone. Register for free at macmillanenglish.com slash gtf now to reserve your virtual seat. See you there.